Welcome to Best Practice, a show where we interview leaders in the building industry to unpack the tools, strategies, and tactics they use to run great organizations. Today, we're excited to be joined by Holly Dykman and Zoe Small of Diller's Cofidio and Renfro about how to run projects and lead teams. Holly Dykman is an associate principal at Diller's Cofidio uh, in Renfro. She was the project architect of the United States Olympic and Paralympic Museum in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and the project director for the adjoining Park Union Bridge, which is a curved steel structure connecting the museum campus to the adjacent America the Beautiful Park. Holly was also the project director for the recently completed Susan Wakil Health Building at the University of Sydney in Australia. She is currently the project director for the new Museum of Transport in Budapest, a new home for the museum located on the brownfield site of a former train repair facility. Um, Zoe Small is an associate principal at DSR. She currently serves as project leader for a technology uh, for a technology company's flagship building in New York City. Zoe was also a project leader for the Museum of Modern Art Expansion and design phase project leader for the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive at the University of California, Berkeley. Zoe also served as a project manager for the Broad Plaza in Los Angeles, a beautiful, beautiful building, and the winning... Um, Zariadie Zari Zari Park Competition in Moscow. I've got to polish my uh, Russian. Russian. Uh, yeah, Zoe was also senior project architect for the public spaces, High Park Pavilion, and Lincoln Restaurante projects at Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts. Quite a breadth of experience with these two folks, and very excited. Also, thanks to Julia Gamalina of Madden Architect and Trahan Architects for helping us put this interview together. With that, thanks, Chris, for joining me again on this series, and thank you very much for joining us today, Holly and Zoe. Thank you so much for having us. Great. Um, I kind of want to start off by just think asking the question around how, from uh, respectively, what is your own lens on practice? Like, how do you look at you know practice is used, the, even the word practice in practice is used in very broad terms sometimes, it can mean a lot of different things. I'm very curious for, for you, like, um, what is what does that outlook look like? And uh, what does that term mean for you? We can start with Holly. Pardon me? Okay. I guess for me, uh, our, our, our practice is not just a, a job. Uh, it's really a passion. Um, and so for us, I think it's really about thinking about us in an urban setting and, and trying to make cities better, trying to make buildings better places for people to be. Um, so I think for us, it's not just about making a building, but making something that really inspires people and challenges and makes them think again. I think just to add to that, um, because we share a lot of the similar outlook on, on the practice, being at the same practice, um, we want to make it fun. We want to love what we do, um, and so we're we're you know we're constantly trying to figure out how to do that. Um, and you know when you kind of instill your projects with an inherent joy, um, it comes across um, in the in the ultimate design and and the, the built product. How do you collaborate together, the both of you, um, in uh, in the firm? Like, I imagine you don't collaborate all the time, but where, where are you collaborating? You know, we actually don't work together on any any projects, um, any architecture projects. Um, usually in, in our firm, um, any particular project leader will run, you know, one to maybe three projects, often just one, depending on the scale of the project. Um, and so we haven't had the opportunity to really work together. Um, but we do share a, a kind of um, common goal of believing in giving back to the firm. Um, and so Holly and I have, have both contributed in sort of special ways to the development of the, 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 the firm itself. So, um, you know, I've been part of um, developing a mentorship program um, and, you know, I sort of pull, pulled together all of the office standards years ago, a project that I wish I could update. Um, and Holly has been part of the really strong part of the DEI initiatives in the, in the firm. Uh, but we haven't had a chance to really work together. 
But yeah, so I think these are really important things in our in our firm um, trying to make a space that uh, welcome welcoming and equitable, diverse, and inclusive. So you know, having Zoe really spearhead this um, this effort initially, and I'm sort of trying to take it another step forward um, with mentorship has been really great. Is it is is it fair to say? Is it, is it that operationally, these kinds of initiatives, how are they structured? Are they, and in some way, do they come from kind of bottoms up? Is it more um, at the, say, executive level to some degree in which these, these, this, these uh, initiatives are being led? And maybe a little bit further, like ultimately, is it, is it typically organized by one person that's sort of, spirit, uh, sort of leading it at the end of the day? I'm curious to learn more about how those initiatives break down. Um, in terms of who works on what? Sure. I think with the DEI, we, we put together a task force to really start thinking about it. And so uh, it was uh, anyone from the studio was invited to join that group. And we, um, it, we took this very seriously in our office. And so we also uh, surveyed, had charrettes with the entire studio to really get input from people. Um, so I, I guess I would say that's more bottoms up. And then um, working with the partners to to see how we implement that, um, and 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 they're very supportive of this whole effort too. So, I think right now we're we're just at a point where we're really trying to to imp improve that and and really um, you know bring it forth more. Um, and uh, some some of the efforts are specifically one person leading it, and some are a group of people. Um, but, but it's been really, really great experience in our office, I think. I mean, a lot of these initiatives come out of, you know, we have, we, we do have leadership meetings. Um, and, um, you know, we also have yearly reviews and, you know, the full staff is open to sort of give suggestions of things that, that could be improved in the firm. And we take that stuff really seriously. And so in these leadership meetings, we try to call out the big, issues that people are encountering in the firm and we we've come you know up with this short list and we just try to address them and the dei initiative is is one of them it certainly came to the very top of the list and that's the one that we've been spending the most time on but there are these other ones that have also been happening as well um, so in a way i guess i would say that they are they are they're they're both bottom up and they are top down because you know we'll read through these these staff reviews but we we are also in the room experiencing the same kinds of issues. So it's sort of a, it's, they, they both sort of go hand in hand. It's, it's, a, it's both, both and approach. You mentioned how the way your kind of management of projects is currently structured is one to three and sometimes even just one project with your full focus on that. How has your approach to running projects evolved over your career? <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I, I was talking to actually kind of laughing with Liz about this recently that um, it takes a certain amount of um, anxiety to be the leader of a project. Um, and it's like this, this um, skeptical stress um, that, that helps you um, always sort of be on your toes, be looking a little bit ahead and sort of keep the team, you know, fresh and ready. Um, because, you know, as, as the, the leader of the project, you need to be the prophet. You need to be seeing as far ahead as you can. You need to be looking down the road. You're, you're charting the course. Um, you, you know, you need to see the iceberg. Um, and, and not only that, but you have to figure out how to get around it. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, um, over the years, it's, it's really something that only could have come from experience and time. Um, and so what, what I see changing is just the, the, um, the distance that I can see ahead. And with more experience, I feel like I have the kind of confidence um, and, and capability to see further into the future um, and and I, I, I can sort of rest more assured 
and be more confident in my own decisions about how to navigate around those obstacles. Um, and actually, I guess, I guess as, as time wears on, those obstacles just keep getting bigger and bigger, <laughs> bigger and bigger and bigger icebergs. Um, I guess I would say, you know, when I, when I started managing projects, it, they were smaller. And so I wore many hats, right? I was the project manager, I was the project architect. I would sometimes build a model because I love building. You know, it was, it was many, many, many parts that I was doing. And as the projects grow, you can't, you just can't do everything. And there's something really wonderful about being able to have your hand in every little part and being knowing every aspect to the project, but you can't do that when it's a really big project. And so I think for me, I really learned that I need to grow my team and I need to help them to, to take on tasks. So help them uh, learn how to, you know, how do you uh, work with a consultant? How do you do the notes? How do you do the, you know, so um, really relying on a team and, and working together. Um, I think that has been the, the biggest thing I, I, that I've changed over time. And then I think, well, as always saying, like, look ahead, I think I used to try to plan out a lot for a very long period of time to a very minute detail. But you realize, I realized that so often there are a lot of things that come along that change that plan, um, you know, that, that, that come up as urgent, urgent items right at the moment. So there's an overarching big picture, but then enough flexibility in the, in the scheduling that we can handle those curveballs when they come. I'm curious about this idea of these bigger icebergs that, that seem to form as probably the DSR's work gets, you know, not only increasingly more and more ambitious in its scope, but also more international. I mean, you know, we just talked about products in Budapest and in other countries, right? Um, do you, maybe Zoe, since you, you kind of brought up this, the being able to see the future in some sense, like, do you have, is it, I'd imagine like anytime you're entering a new country, it's just like all bets are off in terms of how, how far you can totally see. Uh, but I, I'm curious if you've developed any patterns already that you can share with us about whether it's like, e even that is a mental model, right? Oh, if it's a new country, like you have a, you already kind of know who you need to reach out to locally to get a better understanding. Like, can you walk us a little bit through that about maybe the stages of how, of like, when does an iceberg actually get bigger? You know, is it by country? Is it by typology? Because I'm sure like for, for now, like, you know, museums might be a more of a manageable project type for DSR because of the body of work. So, yeah. Um, I, I guess I would say that um, the, the, the different countries thing is, is, there is a, a lot of difference working in different countries. So that, I mean, they're protocol, procedural kinds of differences, but at the end of the day, it's still the design process. I mean, we all have that common language. Um, and so, you know, the, 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 the sort of structure of leadership in, in my mind is still very, very much the same. And, um, you know, maybe to sort of add on to what is what you learn with experience is that there are certain decisions that you need to make early on in the design process. Um, and, you know, being that we're a very design forward firm, um, there are others that you just learn that you can delay and that you know that you'll be able to revisit again later. Um, and so, you know, the, the diffusion of those icebergs, like, you know, just as the project mounts in complexity, you know that things are, there are going to be bigger and bigger complexities. Um, and so I guess um, I've tried to kind of diffuse those smaller ones early on and try to leave the other ones for, for later. But as far as sort of like country to country, I don't, I don't know that it makes that much of a difference. I'd be curious to hear from Holly because she certainly has more experience working overseas. 
Um, but in in my limited experience right now, um, you know, I would say that that the kind of basics are there. The the big differences are sort of in the politics of it, um, and that's not so much with team leadership. That's sort of outward leadership. Um, but but Holly, I want to I want to hear the answer that you've got for that one. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. So this this project that I'm working on in Budapest, it, we. They have a different system actually it, while it's pretty much the same um, what we would call design development stage they call permit plan and so they actually hand in documents to be permitted at the end of what we normally call design development and so it's not as developed and so we did have to adjust and say okay what do we need to develop now what do we need to do later and then certainly there are a lot more complexities with approvals with the authorities that uh, we really have to rely on our local um, architects and consultants to understand and navigate because it's just a different system um, than we're used to. Um, and then uh, I also worked on a project in Sydney. Um, and there, um, I think the system was closer to what we are used to, but certainly um, there, were, there was some navigating to go on <laughs> to, to work out there. And um, but but it was it's more similar I think yeah to what we're used to. I think a lot of people are curious about with uh, Dillers Cafe and Renfro's um, such innovative design output. Is there some magic in the design process that's happening and how you're structuring projects through the whole project life cycle? Um, I like how you're describing the diffusion and maybe like strategic delaying of uh, decisions while keeping others in play or just maybe uncertain until a later point. Um, what, can you give us a peek into how you're structuring that um, across that whole life cycle, like the whole life cycle of the design process and how it might compare between different team leaders? at Diller's Confidian Renfro, or is it actually very consistent across the, the team leads? Um, so I, I, we, we like to joke that, um, I guess it's not really a joke, but CA is the fourth design phase. Um, so we definitely do see design spanning the entire life cycle of the process. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, I mean, again, with experience, you sort of understand that there are certain decisions that you have to make early on and that there are these other ones that you can strategically delay. Um, and it, 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 you know, as a, as a designer, cause just as Holly said, right. We, we all started out in this one place and, and having moved through all of those different um, positions on a team, we're now at this, in this leadership position. So I know what it's like to want to design and spend all of that time. Um, but I also, know from the other end that there's this cap on all of that and um you know in a way to um you know to focus the team better during each design phase i i have to kind of remind everybody that there are certain decisions that we need to make early on um, and that when you get to ca that is the moment when the design either is brought to life or, you know, it, it ends in, in compromise or, or demise. Um, and, and that phase is really key, you know, so we, we try to, um, and our projects, you know, are so, they're so experimental. So there's no, we're not buying something from a catalog, we're creating it from scratch. Um, and so CA is really fundamental to realizing any of these, these, these ways. Um, so, I, I, I agree with Zoe. I think also just, you know, we, we start in the big picture with the concept and then through construction documents here, you start looking at the, the micro, the detail. And then in CA, we realize, you know, you're drawing a typical detail, some atypical, but you're not drawing everything, right? And so that presence on site is really important. Um, and and explaining the design to contractors, the client, and getting them on board with what the vision is, and and um, getting their buy-in to to uh, 
to, 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 to be really excited about the project and to be get them to promote them to be doing their best. Do you find then, um, that's a really, that's a really, really amazing kind of insight about like the, the fourth design phase is CA. Do you find that, has there been any projects where you've been able to bring in some of those, uh, the constituents in the CA phase earlier on board to kind of resolve maybe the, the details that happen in this, in this, during CDs and just kind of get more clarity on those. And like, cause you know, as an experiment, you know, as an experimental office, it's almost like some of those decisions have to also come in sooner too, so that you can mitigate risk downstream. I, I'm curious how, how has that shaken out? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we, we work with lots of fabricators very early on um, because we're, you know, we're, we're, we're inventing new ways of putting, you know, materials together and we're using standard materials in non-standard ways. Um, and all of that does take the input of a, of a, of a lot of people. Um, so we, we involve um, specialists very early on in the design phases. And, you know, we do a lot of mock-ups um, and, um, you know, and, and that also means, you know, you have to kind of take the client along during this, this process too, um, because it's, it's, it is hard to keep a client motivated through that, um, and, and keep them believing in it, uh, because it's, it's, it's much harder to, um, help a client have the vision that you have to be able to see where you're going to get to if there you have no picture or product or precedent to point to. Um, and so these kinds of things, you know, speaking with manufacturers, building mock-ups, those are all ways that we kind of work throughout the throughout the process um, to come up with that final that final product. Um, I'd love to know about your typical work like the different rhythms that happen on a regular basis um, that sort of relate to time. So there's of course like the life cycle of the project and it's, um, you know, it's various stages, but how about on a regular cadence, uh, your, what does it look like? Your, your daily work day, your work week, your work month and your work quarter and work year at, at the office. What, what have you built in as, um, just like a regular cadence in terms of, uh, you know, that kind of a system of time versus these more irregular, longer cycles of time with project cycles. I guess I would say our, our cycles are more related to the projects than a rhythm of uh, a year or a week or a month. Um, but within that, you know, we will set up, you know, so you know, a phase is X number of months, but then we set up maybe uh, every other month or month we have a uh, submission to the client. So then, you know, that backs up then, okay, then we have um, set up a certain time period where we're uh, developing our design. And then at the end of his production um, on a weekly basis, you know, it's uh, Zoom, Zoom and more Zoom right now. So, uh, you know, like, our, our projects, we, we meet with the partners once or twice a week, uh, typically, um, and that that happens through a long part of the project, um, maybe a little bit less um, towards CDs and CA. Um, and then daily, I meet with my team. Uh, we go over the design. We go over, uh, you know, what the what the issues are, um, what we need to uh, look ahead and and uh, work on. Uh, meeting with consultants, uh, we meet with probably all the, all the major consultants every week, um, depending on the phase of the project. Um, yeah, so lots of meetings. Same. <laughs> yeah, yeah, same. I think you know one one thing we've tried to do is. Um, uh, because the world has been so consumed by meetings and meetings and meetings um, is, is that, you know, <laughs> this actually worked on my, my last project. I don't know if it's going to work on this next project, but we tried to designate no meetings Fridays. Um, 
so that we could have a little bit of time because you know that's the thing that we're all sort of missing right now is just time to you know peaceful quiet time to work and think um, and so that that's one thing we tried to work into our schedule um, we'll see how successful that is moving forward <laughs> Yeah, we, we, we definitely it sounds run. like a really good idea, but because <laughs> I'm on a, a project in Europe, I have all, all my meetings in the morning. <laughs> that's that's good too. We we um, so one of the things here at Monograph is that we're a fully remote team too, and and you know the the time zone thing is very real for us as well. One of the things that we try to do is is have like a, we we try to couple information in terms of like, is this something that I can share with you asynchronously? Or like, I don't need a decision on it now. I just need to inform you on it. And that that determines the method in which I'll share something with you. So like we use a tool called Loom to like record ourselves uh, sharing something on our screen real, with like shareable links. And it's like a really quick way to just be able to like share an idea on something or share a recap on something without having like an immediate meeting. Because we are also, we also have a four day work week here. So our pressure on, no meetings is like really real <laughs> and like trying to minimize and just try to get decision making to happen as asynchronously as possible and, and try to minimize those touch points but we don't work on projects it's a little it might, it's a little bit different but uh I'd be curious if people did try more on project-based work how, how that might play out um so one question i i, I had had to do with um the success stories at DSR. I, I'm curious, like how have, are there any internal success stories that have um, become almost like models for the firm? Like, oh, how can we do more of that? How can we repeat that? Whether that's like uh, great client experiences that were delivered or anything else along the project life cycle that are kind of used now as touchstones for, hey, how do, how do we do, how do we ensure more of that to happen? Um, yeah, I guess um, we, you know, as a, as a practice, we had had a long history of, of project production, um, you know, it started many years ago, but it really started in the art world um, and in, in theater. And so when, when we arrived on the scene, on the architecture scene, um, you know, we, we, we were experienced people, um, but not necessarily experienced in architecture. Um, and there were a lot of experienced architects at the firm, but just as a practice, um, we, you know, we were not an experienced practice. Um, and, and, you know, our first major project was Lincoln Center, which was a gigantic renovation, <laughs> a huge project and some, you know, a lot of substantial new construction. And so, um, you know, we, we kind of had to develop this attitude like, hey, you know, you never know. <laughs> And, and we just jumped in and, you know, with the, the tools that we had developed um, to approach uh, any other design projects in the past, um, you know, we were able to implement those, um, use them in, in the same kinds of ways and, and tackle this much larger, much more complex project. Um, and I, and it, it sort of seems like we, we now bring that attitude toward all of these, you know, these these subsequent projects, you know, you, you never know, and the projects just keep getting bigger and more complex, and you know, with more parties involved in decision making, and um, and and I think that you know, our our kind of like hands on, we're we're game, let's just do this thing approach um, is something that we're we're trying to repeat. I think in general, well, I, I think that's true, and I think that. Um, Definitely at Lincoln Center, there were a lot of lessons learned. I think we just also approach each project as its own new thing. And, you know, it, we really tailor to the client, the location. Um, so while there are lessons learned, I think we also try to make sure that we're really addressing that particular project and its needs. Um, both of you have worked at different offices uh, in the past. Um, Dillers Video is clearly not <laughs> another, just another design firm. Um, with, but what's interesting is you're describing the ability to go into a new, effectively a challenge you've never solved before, um, experimentally, 
and it it works. Is is that because challenges are just generally not that hard in the end of the day, or is it actually something characteristic and unique about uh, the office that you can somehow deal with challenges that you don't have as much experience in? Like, I'd love to know why organizationally that's actually possible at at the office. Extreme persistence. I was going to say persistence. <laughs> Yeah, but to the extreme, yes, never give up. No, it's not also, an answer. You know, we, we, we come out of, you know, with art doing a lot, also a lot of research. Yeah, that's just like in our, I think, in our nature. And so uh, when there is a new project, a new problem, we're doing a lot of research and trying to figure out, um, you know, how is this solved or something similar solved? Or how can I uh, take something I know from something else and apply it here? Um, and, I, and I have to say that we have, in my experience, we have an amazing, amazing team of people who are just really creative, but they're also really dedicated. And so, you know, and they're good at thinking outside the box and thinking about it in a new way. So, um, I, I think that's that's probably persistence and creativity together. Absolutely, absolutely. It seems like one internal success story that must be true um, is this idea that you you are reinventing the supply of materials that you actually can build with that's not on the market today because that's not like something that every architect is doing where it's like okay you got this palette of materials in the market. Let's, let's kind of like not look there first. Let's look at something more abstractly. So it seems like that must be some kind of, as an assumption and the, the ability to actually achieve that through CA. Um, is that like an, just a base assumption that like, we're not going to start with the market of available materials as, as a starting point, or, or is that more unique to certain projects? I, th I think that we take an approach that is that design, the, the right design is in some way inevitable. And so it's not that we come to it with, we want to use new materials here. And that's the, it, it comes, it comes from a place of, um, you know, th this is the design idea and it needs this, <laughs> it needs a custom you know, um, translucent wood, that is what it needs. Um, and, and it, and, and in that way, we um, create these projects that seem very seamless. Um, so I, I, I think it's not, yeah, I don't, I wouldn't say that, that it's that we're trying to recreate things. Um, we do have a material library and we use it. Um, but our material library almost couldn't be big enough <laughs> we just because you have to find the right inevitable material for that particular, you know, to solve that particular design problem. Yeah, I, I, th I think it, it depends on the project too. You know, some projects are more, are more suited to having more expensive experimental materials. Um, but I think what Zoe said is um, thinking about the idea behind the project and about the concepts that are part of the project. So we're not just putting a material on there for you know material sakes, but how does it support that idea and 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 cre create a continuity throughout the entire project? And of course, you know, budget also is a big part in this. You know, experimental materials are are exactly it says ex in the name. They're expensive. <laughs> They are so you know it's not that it, it, it's we're, we're very conscious also of of, of, of budget um, you know and of time because there's also there's an element of additional time that comes from inventing materials um, so so you know we, we're also we're, we're very cautious with the the invention of these kinds of things because you know I mean the Invention in architecture also doesn't come necessarily only from new materials. It comes from using very basic materials in different ways. Um, and so that's another way to create a new thing. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really fascinated with like the trade-offs that you make during this design process in order to 
potentially highlight key moves, right? That are going to be the thing, the kind of the takeaway for the project. Or like, what are the the key things that this this project is ultimately like? Where's the line in the sand, right? What are the things that you don't want to ve out because that's like the thing that is making the project the project. Like that is the thing. And so, um, what I'm very curious to is about as an experimental office, the challenges convention through the design process, we talked a little bit earlier about motivating clients. And so these projects have a long span, right? In terms of when the idea was first pitched to when it's finally completed. Uh, and along the way, you don't only have clients, but you also have to keep other people motivated, the contractors to like actually pay it, you know, focus in on the, the right details and the execution, as well as other potential working partners. Um, how, what are the tools that, that you've developed or the, the, the strategies that you've developed to continuously motivate clients along the way? Uh, obviously persistence is one, one tool, uh, but is there anything else that you've uncovered? And obviously this could be at a very client specific level because they all have different affinities and things like that, but is it, do you find that that's being that kind of management of the client and, and their motivation is, is that being managed as a, by a project leader or does that happen somewhere else within the firm? I think, um, you know, often it's really um, explaining to the client um, why things are important and helping them understand why, why this is going to be the thing for the building or one of them. Um, and so doing presentations that are really um, thoughtful and um, you know, in words and then also in images so that they can envision it. Often we find that they just can't, they don't quite see it. Um, and then when, once they, they have visual or a model then they can really um, get on board with it. I know uh, like I was thinking about like US of OPM we had a case where we had a really complicated detail, like where the wall hit the clear story, hit the ceiling, and like the client didn't quite understand it, but was on board. But the contractor just like couldn't get his head around it, the, the, the person doing the actual work. So we actually made, uh, we 3D printed it and brought it, brought it to the site and said, okay, this is what we're trying to do. This is what it's supposed to look like. And then the contractor said like, oh, okay, I get it. I get it. I understand how, what you're, what you want. And that just like, that just helped, you know, that person who was actually like doing the work and also taking the time to talk to that person and, and um, getting that person's input. Actually, I know a lot of times, you know, the contractor sort of seen as the enemy, but I think we need to think of the contractor as the ally and trying to get them to see the vision and see see what it is that we're trying to to achieve. Um, I would I would add one thing, which is that um, we sort of come to expect that we will start off a design project and we you know, we will give, we will give presentations and we're bringing the client along and the, the client is getting excited about the project and they feel totally motivated and they feel a sense of trust. And that's a really big part of this that in the beginning, you have to instill the sense of trust um, with them. They have to trust you because we also sort of laugh about this, that, you know, they are going to rue you <laughs> through the entire design process. And you, and you have to just keep them going along with it because it, it's going to be hard. We're going to fight. We're going to miss, we're going to make mistakes. Um, and, and in the end, the minute this thing is built, they forget all of that and they are so elated with the product. Um, and so, it, it, you know, sometimes actually just, just telling them that I know you're unhappy right now. And I promise you, if you trust me, you're going to love this in the end. So I think, you know, kind of building up that trust in the, in the, in the early initial phases is really, is really key to sort of bringing them along for the long haul. What do you hope or actually see um, your teams that you work with learning from you um, 
as, as a team leader, and earlier in this discussion, you're talking about growing the team, the, key, the, the team's capacity. Um, what are you seeing changing or hope to see change across uh, the colleagues that are working with you on your teams? So, uh, it, you know, my teams, I see um, people who are more junior taking on more roles with communicating with consultants, learning more um, about various systems and how to integrate those into the building. Um, also, I think, uh, you know, in grad school, you, do, you, don't, you don't have that real world experience and just having that experience that then, then um, you also, I think in grad school, don't do as much detailing and, and the getting to see the building in the real world and then talking with me um, and with other uh, senior people in the office to understand how does it get put together? Um, I, I think it just depends on what level you are, what the lesson is. Um, I think communication is also just really important and maybe not as emphasized in grad school. Uh, you give the presentation, but it's not like, how do you work in a team and communicate with others to, to get something done? So I, I think there are a lot of different aspects um, that, that are learned. Um, there's, and I'm always learning too from them, so. Yeah, I think all, all, all of that, um, I mean, it's it's hard to real, I don't, I don't really know what, what, uh, what people are getting from me, it would be, that stuff would be nice to know, but I do know what they're, they're coming to ask me about. Um, and I think, you know, most, I, I can think of um, a couple of things that have been sort of recently where, um, you know, there was a question about how to navigate, you know, a kind of tricky communication situation. Um, and I guess I, I guess I've, tried to say that, you know, you have to write every email with a smile, even if you want to really tell them where to go, <laughs> um, you know, um, so, you know, being careful with your communication, structuring your communication well. Um, and, you know, another, another um, colleague had came to me who was about to have a baby girl, um, male colleague, um, and he said, how, how do I raise, you know, a, a confident and capable girl? Um, and, and I said, you better tell me how to also. <laughs> no, I, um, you know, I, and, and I felt really honored being asked that. Um, and, I, you know, I think, you know, what I, what I try to instill in my team is that I want you to go out there. I want you to take ownership over your, the things that you are responsible for, you know, having a sense of really like having some skin in the game, as they say, um, is really important because um, it makes people believe in their work and they do want to do a better job. Um, and so I also try to, you know, you know, help people um, learn the, steps in the process um, and, and be able to be kind of confident and independent. Um, Self-starter, self-motivated. I try to lead by, by example, um, you know, but always have their back, <laughs> you know, sort of support them when they, when they need help. Um, and I think that's kind of the best way you can kind of help engender confidence um, in others. We have lots of questions um, from the audience here. I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to pick one of these here that I saw. Um, so there's a question about when a new project comes into the office, um, what does the organizational chart look like and how, like, how does a team organize around a new project that comes in and when does that team start to form when the project is coming in? Because as we all know, when a project comes in can actually be quite a long process. Um, so yeah, how do you structure a project coming in and once it's in, how do you staff it? And um, the, the assignment of, the, of leaders like yourself on the projects, we'd love to hear more about uh, the details around that. 
it's actually one of the m most complicated parts of an office because it's like a dynamic being it's constantly moving and you know uh, people are the, the right person for this project isn't necessarily available at the right time um and so a lot of it is trying to figure out what the timing really is going to be um, and then trying to shift the whole puzzle around so that things make sense and you can make somebody else available to fill into that role. Um, so there's, I think there's, a, we really try to evaluate the, the, the needs of that particular project. It's, it's very individual, really depends on, on the needs of the project. Um, but, and, and, you know, you also, you know, sometimes there are ways of, of delaying either you know you, you sort of you know you we want you want to make the you want to have the right people available at the right time um and so you know you can sort of be very upfront with the client and tell them that we need to get this person to be available um uh, so that we can make the pieces fit uh, yeah it's a, it's a complicated puzzle i think um but, but it also varies from, you know, sometimes we win a project by a competition. So then we want to have people from the competition team continue or not. And uh, they obviously have knowledge. Uh, so maybe there's some, some, you know, shifting around of people. Um, and, and certainly people in the office have expressed desires to, to work on it if they've been on the competition. So that's also considered, um, so it, it, it varies, I think, but it, but we, but ultimately, it seems to really set settle pretty well, and then get in a groove. And sometimes, you know, obviously, project teams have to grow and and shrink at certain times, and so it, it's not just right at the beginning. It's 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 through the whole process, I think. Actually, adding just one thing to what Holly said is that. Um, we also like to talk to the people who were asking to be on these teams to make sure that they would like to do that work. So, you know, we do try to keep people who are on a competition to follow the project through if they want to um, and sort of gauge, you know, others' um, interests, make sure that we yeah. can pull together. Yeah. And I think we've also found that people, you know, people like to be on one project. Most people like to be on one project for a longer time. Uh, we used to have people shifting a little bit more and we're trying to, to you know like stabilize it a little bit and have them have a longer period on a turn on a project where they they get to see the different phases and 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 experience those adding to uh the conversation around the phases especially on ca we have a question about um this unique importance that uh, Doris Confidio and Renfro has on CA as the fourth design phase. Does ha, have you come up with a new way or a different way of structuring fee around this that reflects how more involved uh, perhaps you are during this phase compared to other firms? Um, usually, CA is a small percentage and sort of a lean team. Still working on that, but we do. <laughs> 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 it's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, we 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 try to we know that we're going to, um, and every time we get to CA, we always say we knew we were going to do this, <laughs> and here we are. Um, so we we have we have tried in recent years to save money from the earlier phases and try to make it last longer in CA. Um, it's not a perfect process yet, um, but it's definitely something that we're working on. And it's not something that you can really explain to the client necessarily. So it's something that at least at this point we do on our end, on our own sort of cash flow end. Um, we just, we just, we sort of know ourselves at this point. Mm -hmm. And I think also just because CA tends to be long phase, you know, it, it, it is um, definitely have to figure out how to make that work. Yeah. It's a good question. We have a question too about managing client expectations. So uh, what insights can you offer in terms of managing your client's responsibilities? Um, so for example, when they owe action to the process? 
Um, I, I am a fan, a fan of putting it in writing and making sure that they know that uh, we're waiting for them for a decision um, and that it impacts our schedule, impacts our fees, um, you know, in a friendly way, just that, you know, we, want, we both want the best outcome for the project. So um, just, just letting them know that, that that's an important decision that needs to be made and it needs to be made in a timely manner. Yeah, I think we tried to um, introduce schedules um, pretty early on in the process. And um, we like to highlight key decision points along the way so that um, we don't, I mean, we try to the best of our ability not to surprise a client with, you know, sudden decisions. So, you know, you're sort of taking them along the, the process and alerting them that there's going to be a key decision up ahead. Um, and, you know, you, you just, we just sort of, we do the best that we can there. And the rest of it is, as Holly said, it's, it's just good communication. Have you found a way to manage with all the complexity that you're sort of building a schedule of when you might decide versus not? Do you, have you found a way to represent the, <laughs> where you're leaving uncertainty and where you're coming to, um, you know, more precision definition? I, I think it's just got, I don't, I don't know that there's a really good diagram. <laughs> it's, ex, it's experience. You just sort of, you just sort of know where, where you, you're, you're going to have some flexibility in the next phase. Um, and it's, it's really such an important thing um, because you know, again, like as, you know, as a designer, you just want to put all the time in and, and the more time you have, at least in, in the way that I was raised um, and educated, you know, I just worked until the very last second. Um, but there are certain decisions that really almost have to wait until a later phase. Um, but you just, I don't know. I think, I think it's just, I think it's experience. I don't know, Holly, do you, do you know how? <laughs> I, I guess I, I, your question was, how do we represent it? I think like as architects, we're like really graphic people. So we always have to have that bar chart of like, we're doing this, we're doing this and doing this. And at this point you have to make sure like these things are decided. Like we, after this, we, you know, and we, we try to stick to that sometimes the client comes along and wants to change things or you know there's some change that we see that would really make the, the project a lot better um but you know we try to try to show it graphically for for us architects <laughs> i was answering it from the architects end, from the client end, absolutely yes you show them th that's that's exactly right yeah you we have to show them when you need decisions from them and that is done absolutely it's done graphically it's, it's the decisions on our end that are a little more amorphous. Um, we have some more curiosity around the exact team structure of the team. So for example, like a designer, technical person, project manager, production staff, do different types of and sizes of projects change the structure of those teams? Um, do the roles shift? Uh, and do they change over the course of the project? Yeah, so it depends on the project. I think as we're taking on bigger projects, it um, we do tend to be a little bit more um, focused on one particular task or another. But you know, in my team, people are they're doing renderings, they're doing consultant coordination, they do some client communication. So. There, there's a, a broad spectrum, <clears throat> which I think most people enjoy getting a little bit more experience. But um, as the projects get bigger, like I find myself doing a lot more management and someone else is really the person who's spearheading the design um, with, with the partner. I mean, obviously I'm managing all that and uh, giving input, but we do, we do need to have a little bit more siloing um, and within the team, that means also that, um, uh, you know, maybe one person's in charge of really coordinating all the mechanical and someone else doing structure and 
but there but there is a, a lot of communication um, throughout throughout the life of a project it, it really varies because you know in the beginning in the concept phase we are, are very heavy on doing images um, and then it changes to needing more experts tech, technical expertise so you know we have uh, uh, some really great senior people in the office who we then bring in um, to help advise um, and teach some of the younger people. Um, so it's a little bit fluid, but as the projects get bigger, I, I find it, it needs to be a little bit more um, silent. Cool, so I think we're, we're nearing the end of, of the conversation. There's so many questions, I wish we can get to all of them. Um, some really fascinating ones around SAP project sizing that would have been uh, really interesting to, to answer. But um, the final question that we like to ask our guests is uh, away from the business side of things, it's more human. Uh, it's what's the nicest, kindest thing anyone's ever done for you? And start off with Holly. It can be, we've had all sorts of answers here. So nothing is, it's all up to you. Okay. so. It's really hard to think about like what is the very nicest thing, but I'll, I'll give one wonderful thing that happened to me. So I, I was an intern for a summer in, in, at Takanaka in Japan and um, I just gotten paid and I got paid in cash. Uh, so I was on the train and I dropped my wallet, fell out of my pocket and I didn't notice until I got out of the train and the train pulls away. And, you know, my Japanese was, almost non-existent and some stranger saw the panic on my face and he said can I help you and like someone taking the time and I said I just left my wallet on the train so he took me to the station manager the station manager called the end station we waited for a couple minutes till it came and then the conductor at the end station got my wallet the station manager brought me the train, let me on because I had no money for a ticket and no tickets because they were in the wallet. Um, and then I, I got my wallet. So it just was this real reinforcement of like human kindness because anyone on the train could have taken my wallet, but everything was still in the wallet. Nothing had been touched. So I just had this wonderful kindness of many strangers. So that was, that was amazing. I, uh, when I was in high school applying to architecture school, um, I had been accepted to Cornell early decision and um, they had given me a financial aid package um, and it was still expensive. <laughs> and I was really scared. I was really scared to make that kind of commitment. Um, and I was, I, I brought this um, deliberation to my architecture teacher in high school, um, who was this really awesome, outspoken lady. Um, and, you know, she sort of looked at me and said, this, this is a no brainer, <laughs> you're going to Cornell. Um, and I was like, I just, I don't know, I don't know, you know, and, and she said, you know, look, if you have trouble paying for this, I'm, I'm going to pay for it. And, and I will never, I, I mean, I'm sure she wasn't really serious, but at the time I, it, it was such, uh, it gave me such confidence. It was the confidence that I really needed just to, to take that step and to accept the admission. Um, and I'm, and I'm really thankful for that. And there's one other thing that, that happened, um, that uh, you know, I when I was when I was pregnant, or when anyone is pregnant, you can't have um, certain foods that disrupt your stomach, have salmonella, things like that. Um, you know, and yes, you know, it was hard to give up old fashions, any of any of those things, sure, sure. Um, but sushi, <laughs> I just I just really missed sushi, and um, the the day that my daughter was born um, was a hard day, like like as they, as they are. Um, and I went back to my hospital room that evening and there was a sushi dinner sitting there for me. 
Um, and it and my husband had put it together and it was just the best hospital grade sushi <laughs> I could ever have imagined. So super kind. Uh, thank Very you both thoughtful. for yeah, thank you both for sharing uh, those stories. With the Japanese one, I couldn't help but thinking of how like efficient the Japanese train system, the transit system is that they're able to do all that routing. Like if it was New York, oh, I don't know. No uh, chance. No <laughs> chance. Uh, shout out to the MTA system in New York. Um, well, thank you both for for uh, for this lovely conversation around operations at DSR. I think we learned a lot about how DSR operates, and really thank you both for sharing. Um, and I, I kind of just uh, leave with one uh, little little blurb here about what we do here at Monograph for those that might not know. Um, architects are calling Monograph a game changer. Principals, operations leaders, and office admins are using Monograph to run firm operations and manage the back office. It's designed for architects by architects about maybe now we're kind of growing, so it's kind of shifted, but maybe about 30% of the firm, of the, sorry, of Monograph, not firm, uh, has some background in architecture. I myself, landscape architecture, architecture, and we have, you know, we all really care deeply about the industry and how to, how to improve it. And so uh, Monograph customers are reducing their Monday morning staffing meetings and looking six months out at their buildings to plan when to hire, when to bring on new projects. We're giving people foresight. Some of what we talked about today. Try it out for yourself. You can start a free trial today at monograph.com or book a one-on-one -on -one demo with one of our amazing team members. Thank you both for joining us uh, on this uh, lovely day. Uh, Chris, as always, thank you. And thanks for everyone uh, in the audience. Thank you. Thanks for bringing attention to this because, you know, we all talk a lot about design, but, you know, management is, uh, though not as glorious, is still really, it's everything. really important. It's it everything. enables, it enables Enable. great work yeah. to happen, right? I mean, yeah, there is uh, no, there is no, there is no design without good management. They are very dependent on each other. Thank you. Thank you both. Thanks to everybody. Thank you, Zoe and Holly and George. We'll be sending a recording out uh, probably in two weeks. Um, and, uh, if you know someone who wanted to come, but missed it, uh, just let them know. We'll have this recording now in about two weeks. So thanks everybody. Thanks everybody in the audience. Lots of great questions. Really appreciate those. Sorry. We couldn't get to all of them. Um, another day, maybe uh, reach out to Holly or Zoe, if you have a, pr a pressing question. Uh, thanks everybody. Thanks. Check out our podcast on Spotify. Bye.